Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome once again to Voice in the Wilderness Ministries. We are so thankful that we have so many wonderful intercessors, prayer warriors, people that support this ministry, and all kinds of friends. We thank you all for being with us this last four years, and we pray to the best of our ability that we're going to serve you and the Lord and do everything we can to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now today, if you want to turn in your Bibles to, to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and I want to speak to you about a part of the Scripture that speaks more volumes about God's love than almost any other considering the principles involved in the story. There is no greater description of the measure of the love of God towards sinful mankind in the form of a story than that of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Of all the parables, accounts, and deeds of Jesus Christ, the, par the parable of the Great Samaritan is the greatest display of mercy and compassion outside of the cross itself. If you understand the nature of the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans, you can comprehend just how eye-opening this story truly is. It is also the greatest indictment against organized religion and the brazen lack of compassion that many of us have for the less fortunate around us. It is an object lesson then and now to never be so consumed with our lives that we forget the needs of those around us. We must be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in creating those opportunities that we can demonstrate compassion to those that are in need. The promise of this parable, which so often is neglected in the body of work, is why the story exists in the first place. The premise of this parable is usually what drew men to Jesus Christ who were not sick or afflicted in their bodies. They came to Jesus because they wanted an answer to one question that has haunted the souls of men since we've worked face of the earth when we were created by God. What must or what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, but in this illustration, I, I use this illustration becomes, because it comes with a very peculiar twist in the middle of it. Prompting the parable would define the true love of God forever. Throughout the history of mankind's existence, ever since physical death became the inevitable end to all human life, man has sought to find the source of or the pathway to eternal life. The soul of every human being is inst instinctually understands there is more to eternity than just the time we occupy here on the earth. The secret to living forever is the holy grail of all human knowledge, from astrology to science to the wisdom of the seers of this world, to the wisdom of the seers, the words of the prophets, and every religion ever courted. Mankind is in constant pursuit of the source of eternal life. So it is inevitable that when Jesus walked the face of the earth, the most frequent question that was made of him was, What must I do? to inherit eternal life. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? During his three and a half year ministry, Jesus was asked in several various forms, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Nineteen times in scriptures, directly or indirectly, this illustration, this issue comes forth. The synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record instances of men approaching him with this specific request. In Matthew 19, verse 16, the Bible says, Master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Mark 10, verse 17, the rich young ruler. And when Jesus was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and said, Good Master, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Luke 20, 10, verse 25, the premise of this story. A certain lawyer stood up and said, Ask Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And in Luke 18, 18, 
A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So the issue of eternal life is the premise of almost all of the narratives of Jesus Christ. At some point, it leads to eternal life. It's about eternal life. It's finding the way to eternal life. It is the instinctual pursuit of all human beings in their gods, the hope that they place in them of their eternal life when this is all over. But today, we want to focus on an encounter that transpired between Jesus Christ and a certain lawyer that was trying to tempt Jesus with his own words. It is at this point in Luke 10, we are introduced to a certain unnamed lawyer, an expert on Jewish law, tempting Jesus about what we must do to inherit eternal life. In Luke 10, verse 25 through 29, a certain lawyer, in verse, starting in verse 25, and a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, What is written in the law? How does it read? And the lawyer answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said, You have answered right. Do this and live. But the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Who is my neighbor? Who do I show compassion to and who do I not show compassion? Who are you specifically referring to as my neighbor? There is a tremendous conflict in the Old Testament interpretation of friend and enemy. They are clearly designated in the Old Testament how to treat your neighbors and loved ones and how to treat your enemies. And it's about to take a very, very stark 180 degree turn based on these very words right here. And if you're a Gentile, you would be very, very glad that the Gentile is somebody who's non-Jewish. You would be very, very glad that Jesus is beginning to impart that God's mercy is extended to the Gentiles as well. That God loves you just as much as he loves anybody else. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The lawyer stood up and said, and who is my neighbor? Now this was not done out of ignorance. He was a Jewish scholar, a master of the law. He knew every jot and tittle of the scriptures. These guys spent their entire lives with their faces in the Bible. So when he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, he is trying to trap Jesus in his own words. He knew the scriptures of both of those statements. Both of those statements read as follows. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And in Leviticus 19, verse 18, the Bible says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is where the trouble is. Jesus confirms that the lawyer has given him the right answer. And he encourages him that if he continues in that truth, he will actually have eternal life. His words, not mine. The lawyer's knowledge of the Word of God had shown him the pathway to eternal life. But the lawyer clearly approached this encounter with an entirely different agenda. Looking to justify himself and attempting to catch Jesus in his own words, the lawyer pushed the point a little farther and asks, And who is my neighbor? Or who do I really need to love and to care for? Who do I really need to love and to care about? It becomes easy to demonize the lawyer for his treachery, and almost, but yet all of us, almost all of us feel the same way without saying it. 
But the implication remains the same. Who exactly is my neighbor? What do I, who do I really need to love and care for? The lawyer was just saying out loud what every one of us has considered at one time or another. You see, humanity is very, very tribal. We can easily identify tribalism today because mankind has labeled their tribes, nations, communities, people, and peoples. Some of them are, some of them are obvious, others not so much. But the most visible of this kind of labeling is in obviously in race, color, ethnicities, political affiliation, liberalism, conservatism, sports fanaticism, social status, power circles, influences, clubs, and cliches, to name just a few. Even Christianity, which has historically carried the message of salvation to all people, indiscriminate of the human perception of who deserves it and who doesn't, always trumpeted the message of whosoever will, let him come, has succumbed to the, to the devising trap, divisive trappings of tribalism, which has historically carried the message of salvation to all people, indiscriminate of the human perception of who's worthy of it or not, and has always trumpeted the message to all people all over the world, whosoever will, let him come, has succumbed to the divisive trappings of tribalism. From the very entrance of the church into human existence, mankind has sought to redefine its content with man-made labels. While the denomination, <coughs> with, the, with the denominations that time has kept up to now, and the recent phenomena of independent churches and ministries mostly carrying a worldly carnal version appealing to the masses, absolute truth has ceded to the whims and beliefs of individualism. And corporately, individualism becomes tribalism. The consequence of this divisive behavior has now has become very difficult to define just exactly what Christianity actually is anymore. As ministers with this timeless truth, we are to spare our flocks from the wolves, protect the wheat from the tares, preserve a timeless eternal message that has been entrusted to us, and to defend the truth against all worldly, carnal, and demonic influence or infiltration. But we are also called to reach every soul in the world we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and hence the internal conflict of who we actually try to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have become very, we have, been, we have been readily accepted to preach the gospels that believe and to think the same way we do. You seldom see a Pentecostal message directed to a church of another denomination. You seldom see any other denomination or group of people reach across the world to try to reach they stay basically inward to the people that believe the same way, preach the same, and there is certainly in discipleship a place in Christianity for that. But you're called to reach all people, including those that don't agree with you. Before you become too critical, we all have a world to reach. And all of this infighting and bickering that's going on isn't doing anybody any good and jeopardizes our own walk with Christ, our own call, and our own ultimate destiny in Christianity is defined by our relationship to the gospel. If we don't abide by the gospel, we're all going to be in trouble. So it's time to stop fracturing the church through the egos of men and humble ourselves before God and pray and see if we can't win this world for Jesus Christ. This stunningly provocative inquest into the nature of what defines the term neighbor by the lawyer neither alarms nor deters the response from Christ. Jesus simply tells a story. Many people call it a parable. Some believe this event actually happened. Whatever you believe, its substance is life-changing to all who follow Christ. Jesus introduces this parable in Luke 10, verse 30, and I quote, and Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, 
which stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half naked. Now there are three important points to remember in the opening of this parable. First of all, you must understand that the audience that witnessed this encounter between Jesus and the lawyer as he was talking were all Jewish. This will help you understand the significance of the narrative that culminates this message. Number two, the implication of the nature of the man who fell among the thieves. It is evident based on the speaker and the audience that the man mentioned here, fact or fictional, is a Jewish man. Due to the ethnicity of the listening audience, the nature of the outcome of this parable would have a far different interpretation if he was anything but Jewish. Lastly, whether the story is real or a parable, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is a very real road. It was a very familiar road to anybody who lived in first century Palestine. Jesus and his audience were extremely familiar with that road, a twisting and turning path with many cliffs and caves. It was a very treacherous road, full of danger. It was a road that was coined at the time the way of blood because of the significant amount of bloodshed inflicted on the innocent by the robbers that lined its boundaries. <coughs> Excuse me. In Luke 10, verse 31 through 32, the Bible says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked upon him and passed by on the other side. It has been implied over the years that the priest and the Levite pretended that they could not stay and help the poor man because they were in haste to go and attend the temple service in Jerusalem. It has also been implied that both men actually, never actually saw the man in his condition. But the Bible states that they clearly did. The priest and the Levite did nothing at all because of their own self-righteousness. But according to Christ, whatever the reason, their abandonment of this man was clearly inexcusable given their place of leadership. It is sad. It is heartbreaking. It is heart-wrenching when we, who all should be examples of charity, are prodigies of cruelty. And those who should be displaying the tender mercies of God and open the bowels of mercy to those who need it should shut up their own. It should be noted again that this man was one of them, a Jew. This was not a stranger. This was not a barbarian. This was not a robber. This was a Jewish man. This was one of their people. This is one of their flock, one of their sheep. Someone they were given stewardship over and they passed by him lying half dead in the road. So it's not, it's not good. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 31, Whosoever is kind to the needy honors God. Proverbs 21, 13, the Bible says, If a man shuts his eyes to the cries of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And Isaiah 58, verse 10, If you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. God wants you to treat the poor right. In 1 John 3, verse 17, the Bible says, If any man have material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity in him, how can the love of God live in him? But we're talking about an illustration that this person's not even a brother. He's not of the same country. They are at war, religious war with each other. Actually, almost real war with each other. John Stott, the famous theologian, said, The perspective of Scripture is not the survival of the fittest, but the protection of the weakest. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, When we see innocent people suffering as the result of the sin of others, our pity should be inflamed. Luke 10, 33-35 but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the injured man was, 
And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And he set him on his own beast and took him to an inn and took care of him. And in the morning when he left, he took out two pence and gave it to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and if you spend any more when I return, I will repay you. I want, to show you, I want you to consider the mercy the Samaritan showed when he left. I want, oh, Jesus. Now, I want you to consider the mercy the Samaritan showed this left-for-dead traveler. He went to the critically injured man, the very man rejected by the priest and the Levites of his own people, his own people, and sought to inquire how he arrived at this miserable, miserable condition, no doubt diagnosing what he can try to do to save him. Next, he played the role of the EMT doctor. He bound up the open wounds, most likely making use of his own linens for this purpose. He poured in oil and wine, which he had carried with him, to wash the wound and the oil to mollify it, and close the wound up before the infection could set in. He did all he could do to ease the pain and peril of his wounds, likely saving the man's life right there and then. Next, he took him to an inn. There is no doubt that whenever the Good Samaritan was heading, wherever the Good Samaritan was heading to, he was not going to arrive on time. But in compassion to the poor man, he cuts his own trip short and takes him to an inn. This act of mercy is simply too important to ignore. Once arriving at the inn, he made a concerted effort to take care of him. He got him a bed, he no doubt got him food and water, and most hopefully he wound up praying for him. As for the man who fell among the thieves, one of his own family members, as, as if the man who fell among the thieves was one of his own family members, and he was obliged to look after, before he left the following morning to conclude his journey, he left money with the innkeeper to be laid out for his continued care. Two pence did not sound like much money, but back then it was more than enough to complete the care of the injured traveler. Even so, if that was enough, was not enough, the Samaritan promised to make up the difference the next time he came around. But Christ tells the parable for another reason, far more important reason. This parable completely sets forth the kindness and the love of God and our Savior Jesus Christ towards sinful, miserable men. All we, before we came to Christ, were in the same condition as this very distressed traveler. Satan, the, en the enemy of God, everything God loves, has robbed us, stripped us, and wounded us through the sin we have transgressed against the Holy God. We are, by our own sinful nature, spiritually and physically dead, twice dead in our trespasses and sins, utterly unable to help ourselves from the wounds of our own sin. For we were yet without strength. Even the law of Moses, like the example of the priest and the Levite, mentioned in the parable, ministers of the law, looks upon us but has no compassion on us. It gives us no relief, no pity, but simply passes on the other side of our hopeless condition, showing us no pity nor power to help us. But then arrives our blessed Jesus Christ, that eternal good Samaritan for all that are lost and without hope. He has compassion on us. He has tender mercy on us. He binds up our wounds, but not with oil and wine, but that which is infinitely more precious with his own blood. He takes care of us. He heals us. He delivers us. He sets us free and puts out all of the expenses of the cure on his own account. And all this, all of this, and he was not as we are. This infinitely magnifies the love of God as a light to every man walking the face of this earth. Now we conclude with this. Luke 10, 36 through 37. Jesus submits to the lawyer. Which now of these three 
do you think was neighbor to the man who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer replied, he that showed mercy to him. See, he wouldn't even call him a Samaritan. He simply acknowledged his gift and his mercy and compassion because he was forced to. He could offer no other explanation other than the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. The emphasis of this parable is that an errant to true saving faith and obedience to Christ are compassion and care for the less fortunate of this world. The call to love God is a call to love others. The new life and grace that God gives to those who accept Christ will produce love, mercy, and compassion for those in the world that are distressed, bereaved, and afflicted. It is the responsibility of every believer to act upon the unction of the Holy Spirit, love within him, and not to harden our hearts to the needs of those around us. Those who profess Christ and yet remain unsympathetic and indifferent to the needs of those that are around us and the less fortunate around us testify that eternal life does not dwell in them. In Matthew 5, 43 through 44, the Bible says, You have heard that it has been said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Psalm 41, 10. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the good and the evil and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publican so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, it's more than a static confession and acknowledgement that I am Lord. It's not enough to just believe that Jesus Christ is. You must act upon it the chain, and be regenerated in the soul and the spirit. You must have a heart and a compassion for those that are around you that are in need. Well, Pastor, are you saying that's what gets me into heaven? No, I'm not saying that's what gets you into heaven. The blood of Jesus Christ gets you into heaven. But if the blood of Jesus Christ has get, gotten you to heaven, then the compassion and the love of those who do not know what you know should become the centerpiece of every activity you do outside of your worship of Jesus Christ and your prayer and the study of the Word. The mercy of others, the compassion to the lost should become a priority in your life and not just an example to offer uh, futile attempts at mercy and compassion. Not everyone, Matthew 7, 21, says, Lord, who, who calls me Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of people would do well to take heed to that statement. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to get in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name did many cast out devils, and in thy name did many wonderful works, and then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. That's not a good thing. There's nothing good about that at all. An even more distinct requirement and compassion, compassion to the lost is in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and then all nations shall be brought before Him, and He shall separate them one from the other, as shepherds divide the sheep from the goats. And He shall set, he shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall, then shall the King come to say to those on His right hand, Come, blessed of my Father, Inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me. Then shall the righteous answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and take you in, or naked, or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came to you? And Jesus shall answer and say unto them, And as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, 
you did it unto me. Then he shall say to them on the left, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not feed me. I was thirsty, and you did not give me drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was, clo I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then shall he also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, or naked, or sick, and in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he say unto them, Truly I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to the least of one of these, you did it to me. And these shall go away, these shall go away into everlasting fire, everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Central to saving faith is the commitment to love and to serve God while we are here on this earth. Just as importantly, we are to display the same broken heart for fallen humanity that Christ was implying. Christ takes this as serious as anything he spoke of, and this part of the blueprint for our relationship remains to this day. Every, despite every dispute, war of words, squabble, clash, or wrangling that goes on in the Christian faith today, ultimately we'll be judged by our fruit and not our knowledge. Again, saving faith is an active participle that recognizes where and who we are supposed to be touching with the hope of all men for the, re for the reason that God dwells in us. As the conclusion of all things fast approaches, it is incumbent for all of us to be true ministers and go into this world and make a difference. It is time to try to, to go back to reaching the lost. We have preached to the choir for far too long. And we are naturally attracted to people that think like we do, believe like we do, all of, the, all of the prerequisites of a comfortable relationship. Christianity is a difficult walk from time to time because you are asked to trust the Lord around people, places, and things that are uncomfortable and that oppose everything He stands for. And to that end, it takes an unction of the Holy Spirit that is above and beyond the standard measure, but has a hunger and a desire to make a difference in the lives of those who are trying, who need it the most. Compassion is not something that is just regulated to missionaries or outreach programs. Compassion should be a daily working spiritual stream in your church, and without it, your church is going to die the slow and miserable death. Love and compassion is what brought you to Jesus Christ. Mercy and grace has saved you through Jesus Christ. And that is your ticket to heaven. But it comes with a prerequisite that you are going to try to love and show compassion as Christ has loved and showed compassion unto you. It is not a works-based versus election-based doctrine. You are to go to work for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have been sitting around here bickering about this for too long. God expects us to take our anointing and go out in this world and do something with it. If you're a minister, if you call yourself a minister, and you've never won a soul to Jesus Christ, you need to take that off your name. Ministry is about going out and reaching those that not just think like you do, but oppose everything you believe. Voice in the Wilderness Ministries is going to reach the world with the gospel. Most of them don't care or don't like it or wish we'd go away. That's their option. But there is a lost world that is hungry for the truth. And far more people than you think are living in brokenness and darkness and bereavement and hopelessness. And far more people would rather end their lives than live and continue to live in it. What kind of hope are we offering to those people? What kind of future eternally are we presenting to them? It's time to take the worldliness out of the church and out of our ministries, fall on our knees, pray to God how we can have more compassion towards the lost of this world. As we worship Him, may we all have an outpouring of the love of God to all we come in contact with, indiscriminate of whether they're the same color or the same ethnicity or whatever group or label you have placed upon them. Extend to all the love of God as the love of God has been extended to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.